Welcome back for more AP Biology. We're going to talk about cell membranes today. In particular, how does its structure tell you about its function? It's one of those patterns that exist in biology. We gave you a few of them. We do care about membranes. They show up in a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to use it a lot when we talk about diffusion and osmosis and what mitochondria and chloroplasts do. But when you read the book, something to focus on. So when we look at a cell, what we know is the inside is alive and whatever its composition is, our goal is to keep that composition what it is. So we are going to attempt to keep cells alive. And you can see that there's a particular distribution of the types of materials inside of a cell, but that doesn't tell us what exactly we happen to have. So like it says small molecules, well, what do we mean by small molecules? And do we need to have a certain balance of those? And the answer is yes. And you know, proteins, what type of proteins? Do we have a balance of those? Yes and so on and so forth. So we have all sorts of things that we need to look at. One of those things, we let's start simple, is just the, the phosphobilic bilayer, the membrane, the outer portion, the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. And what we notice is it's composed of phospholipids, but those phospholipids aren't necessarily always the same. So we notice that, okay, there are lots of different types of phospholipids that compose this membrane. What we know about phospholipids based upon their structure is they are what we call amphipathic, meaning the top portion, so with the mouse you could see me pointing at the spherical portions, we call those the hydrophilic heads. They're things that can be attracted to water or charged or polar molecules. And then we have the hydrophobic tails, which are basically fatty acids, so they don't like being around water or water doesn't like being around them and they're just kind of stuck in the middle and you form a barrier. This thing, for the most part, is a barrier, separating outside from inside. The exception to that is there are substances that can move right through that phospholipid bilayer, and those would be things that we would call nonpolar compounds. An example of that would be gases, so oxygen can flow right into a cell or right out of a cell. If I were to look at something like acetone, so nail polish remover, that can wash into and out of cells, no issue because it's nonpolar. The other thing I'll notice in that membrane outside of lots of phospholipid is their proteins. And there are lots of different types of proteins. And these are just categories of proteins. So they can be connectors or they perform the job of what we would call an enzyme or they are a transport. So they actually let things or allow things to move or force things to move across the membrane or their recognition, so their identifiers, or we can use them for attaching to other structures that aren't cells, or we use them for signaling. There's all sorts of stuff that we can do with these membrane proteins. And we could go on forever on that one, but we won't. I want to focus in on those, the phospholipids primarily. And when I look at those phospholipids, what I'll notice is they don't actually stay the same. When it's cold, they actually become what we would call unsaturated, meaning they have kinks in them. And the reason for that is you can't freeze the membrane. You can't make oil turn into butter. But when it's hot outside, they actually become rigid. And the reason for that, so they become what we would call saturated, straight chained. Why would they do that? Because if it's too hot, we don't want something loose holding the cell together because loose things boil away. So if we make it so it's more like butter, it's going to be harder to destroy the butter than it is to destroy oil. So we'll notice that the composition of it will change depending on what's necessary, typically with temperature. But not all phospholipids turn out to be the same. So if I were to look at cell membranes between different types of organisms like the archaeans and just bacteria and the eukaryotes, what I'll notice is the structure of these is actually different. They actually build themselves differently. Archaeans actually make a monolayer of phospholipids, but they make it, the reason why they make it a monolayer is they take their two bilayers, or the bilayers, and they join them together, which is strange because we don't do that. But if I look at bacteria and eukaryotes, the types of phospholipids that we use turn out to be different. So different types of organisms actually build their membranes differently, even though it's fat and protein, which is strange. The way we attempt to visualize all of this is what we call the fluid mosaic model. 
and it was put forth in a paper from 1972 by Singer and Nicholson. And what I'm going to be having you all do is actually read excerpts of that paper. It's nowhere near as long as the Lynn Margulis paper. Here's my copy of it. Primarily, you're going to look at the figures, and there's a summary written up for you, which summarizes the pictures. But what I'm going to have you do is look at it, and you're going to be answering some questions regarding, or in class you answered questions regarding that paper. It's not a difficult thing, but it's where this origin of how we view the fossil lipid bilayer comes from, or how, which is this fluid mosaic model, which if you notice in this lecture, I did not define. We use this. We're going to use your paper to figure out what is the fluid mosaic model.